Should the lines be named after A, Britain's greatest victories, B, our greatest colonial viceroys and governor generals, or C, my six children? Results to be revealed shortly. Plus, State of the Nations Book Club returns with Sunday Times columnist Matthew Said after he recommended I read his book Rebel Ideas when he took issue with my accusation that MI5 was being institutionally racist to white people. Well, I've read his book, and it's very good, and it's time to review it and discuss it with him. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by my most intellectual panel this evening, GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and the economist and fellow at the Centre for Brexit Policy, Catherine McBride. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now, it's what you've all been waiting for, the news of the day with Polly Middlehurst. Jacob, thank you, and good evening to you. The top story from the GB Newsroom tonight. The Chancellor says, despite the UK entering into a recession, the UK economy is turning a corner. Official figures show the economy shrank by 0.3% at the end of last year, following similar contractions in the previous three months. It's the first time the UK's GDP has dropped since the first half of 2020 after the COVID lockdown. Jeremy Hunt insists, though, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. We always expected growth to be weaker while we prioritise tackling inflation. That means higher interest rates. And that's the right thing to do because you can't have long-term healthy growth with high inflation. But also for families, uh, when, the, when there's a cost of living crisis, when the cost of their weekly shop is going up, their energy bills are much higher, it's the right thing to do. The underlying picture here is an economy that is more resilient than most people predicted. Inflation is coming down. Real wages have been going up now for six months. And if we stick to our guns, independent forecasters say that by the early summer we could start to see interest rates falling. Jeremy Hunt speaking there. Now, international news and in a call to the Israeli Prime Minister tonight, Rishi Sunak has urged for the full flow of international aid to be allowed into Gaza. Downing Street said the Prime Minister pressed Benjamin Netanyahu on the humanitarian crisis in the region, stressing the need for swift action. It comes as the latest videos from Gaza show distressing scenes from inside the Al Nasser hospital on the Gaza Strip, with people gathering in corridors filled with dust and smoke and devastation outside. Israeli forces say they raided the complex based on credible information that Hamas was hiding there and hostages could be found. The number of overseas students applying for university places in the UK has risen for a second year running. New data shows over 115,000 students from outside the UK applied to start in September. However, the number of international applicants remains below the high of just over 116,000 before the pandemic. The data comes after Universities UK announced it would review overseas student admissions processes following allegations of bad practice by agents recruiting foreign students for lower grades. Now, voters are casting their ballots in the final hours of two by-elections taking place tonight in Wellingborough, that's in Northamptonshire, and Kingswood in South Gloucestershire. The Kingswood vote was triggered after Conservative Chris Skidmore quit in protest over the government's green policies. And in Wellingborough, polls are open because Peter Bone was accused of bullying and sexual misconduct, allegations he denied. Voting closes at 10 o'clock tonight. GB News will be broadcasting throughout the night with expert analysis and all those important results from midnight tonight right through to breakfast first thing in the morning. For the latest stories, do sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. The latest news from the Bank of England. Well, I think we've got it in a clip here. Oh, ostrich, consider how the world we know is trembling on the brink. Have you heard the news? May I hear your views? Will you tell me what you think? The ostrich lifted his head from the sand about an inch or so. 
You will please excuse, but disturbing news, I have no wish to know. Well, Peekaboo, I can see you. It's 2023, a year of recession. And the culpability for this recession must surely lie with the Bank of England. Why ostriches? What are ostriches famous for? They bury their head in the sand. They don't listen to or learn from experience. They don't see what is happening and act upon it. They hide from it. And what did happen? Well, during COVID, there was excessive quantitative easing. This went well beyond what was necessary when uh, supply was short, that things weren't getting through, goods weren't getting into the UK because of complications with deliveries. And that inevitably meant that there was likely to be inflation. Indeed, it was pointed out that inflation was likely to happen by people like uh, John Redwood and Andy Haldane, the economist, the chief economist at the Bank of England, warned of inflation, but they ignored him. And interest rates were increased too slowly. Other countries started putting theirs up. The Federal Reserve was fast at whack, but the Bank of England didn't. It was slothful. And that meant that inflation was worse than it needed to be. Indeed, if they hadn't done the final round of quantitative easing, inflation may not have been as bad altogether. But now it's the reverse problem. Having been slow to act in the first place, it's now slow to react. It is cutting too slowly. Interest rates ought already to be coming down because inflation is a lagging indicator. What do I mean by that? Inflation happens after the event. So you have the monetary action, QE, or interest rate changes, and then inflation comes at some time later. It doesn't happen in a synchronised fashion. And that's why it's so important to look forward and estimate what may be about to happen before you make your changes. And that's what the bank hasn't done. The governor is blaming this on poor data. Well, that's actually not a new criticism. In 1956, Harold Macmillan said that it was like running the economy on last year's Bradshaw. Well, Bradshaw was the train railway timetable guide, and it was saying that he was doing it on out-of-date information. All economic policy is done on out-of-date information. That's the whole point. That's the job. And unfortunately, the Treasury, the OBR, the Bank of England model doesn't work. And it's stultifying policy making. And it means that we're not getting the right decisions through. And this combines with the worrying rise in economic inactivity, the 9.3 million people who are economically inactive. And that's gone up by about a million. We need to get people back into work. And that's partly by ensuring that the benefit system, which was doing a very good job from 2010 in the early years of the Conservative and coalition governments in getting people back to work, we need to re-emphasise that. But we also need dynamic economic policy. We need the government to be spending less, to be wasting less. We need civil servants back at work. And we need to leave more money in your pocket. We need the tax cuts that may help stimulate growth. We also need interest rate cost cuts, but the... Um, Ostriches may not be providing that immediately. As ever, let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. Um, but I'm delighted now to be joined by my very distinguished panel, Nigel Nelson, um, who you know of old, and um, Catherine McBride, who was with me in Scunthorpe fairly recently. Um, Catherine, it's hopeless, isn't it? The Bank of England just isn't getting this right. Certainly, it's like running a, an oil tanker. You have to start slowing down long before you need to, otherwise you'll run into the port. And they really should start cutting rates. Uh, most people do think that the... the um, even the, the figures we're looking at are also out of date. So, you know, things are looking a little bit um, more cheerful in January, and hopefully they will be. But as you say, it's not just the GDP figures, it's the GDP per capita. And this is a real problem, and it is something that the government can do. It's in their hands um, of getting people back to work. And one thing is to look at the tax, the IR35, which sent a whole lot of people who were running their own companies out of, out of work, the very high welfare payments that people can get, which is almost equivalent to the amount they'd get if they were working in a low-level job or a short-hour job. Um, you've got to look at the th almost 3 million people who are on long-term sick. I mean, what's, what are they sick with? And why aren't we fixing them if they're, if they're so sick they can't work? Um, now, Nigel, Independence Bank of England isn't looking so clever anymore, is it? Because 
Um, the politicians take responsibility when it goes wrong anyway. Yes. <laughs> um, and it's the Bank of England that has bungled. Well, I mean, there, there is obviously an argument about whether they got the balance right. Um, the Bank of England's job is to control inflation. Which it failed. Well, well it, it seems to be succeeding. I mean, by putting interest rates up, we've seen inflation come down. The problem, I think, with your analysis is that you're saying we should have tax cuts now to actually get some kind of economic growth. And with um, inflation still twice the, the 2% target, it does seem to me the wrong time to have tax cuts simply because we've got an election coming up. Well, I don't want it for election purposes. I actually want the size of the state to be smaller. I want it to be funded from cutting expenditure because I think the state is spending too much, taxing too much, and that is leading to low economic growth. That's at the heart of our economic malaise. But if we'd had the kind of growth that, say, uh, the OECD have had, uh, I mean, Rachel Rees was talking about an extra £50 billion pounds in tax that that would, have, that would have delivered when she was speaking earlier today. So the, the whole thing is that the, the, the growth bit, and I think that Catherine's absolutely right, the, the, the really worrying figure is nearly two years of GDP per person going down. So that's, what, £12,500 that is costing people. But yeah. in that period, we've had 1.4 million people extra come into the country who come in inevitably with a lower GDP. So mass migration is finally being exposed as an economic weight rather than economic boost. Not quite, because a lot of the, of the 700,000 that are coming in, about two-thirds of them were students. And those students are not technically an export, but they are on average paying £25,000 per year in their tuition. They also have to pay for rent and uh, food. Uh, so they're bringing in at least... With well, 400000 well, that's the, £10 billion pounds But the, that year. includes, though, the student dependents who aren't going well, to be providing that £25,000. So it's not quite as simple as that. Yes, it's, it's not quite as simple. And, um, I mean, they'll have to live somewhere and eat somewhere, but... Uh, most of them, I think, are coming in without dependents. There are dependents, obviously. And then there's about 200,000 that are coming in to work. Uh, they are adding to the economy, but if they can come in at 20% uh, lower than the average fee, uh, average wage, then they are reducing... They are the, reducing um, and what, GDP return. per capita is about $46,000. So anyone who comes yeah. in to contribute needs to be contributing more than $46,000 in the first year. To increase it, yes. And or, I think that is a therefore going to be a weight on the economy. Because yes. if you're getting GDP at 0.1% and GDP per capita falling, what, by 0.7%, then where else is the disparity coming from? Otherwise, there's quite a sharp down downturn for people domestically. Yeah, well, the, the other disparity is the fact that there's a lot of capita who are not working. And that's the other, the major problem, the 9 million people who are not um, gainfully employed but of working age. And that's been going up. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you to my panel. I can now put that to Professor Michael Jacobs of the University of Sheffield and visiting senior fellow at ODI Global Think Tank. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for joining me. Um, this is not a pretty picture, and the Bank of England is responsible for the key lever of economic policy. It's got it wrong, hasn't it? Um, well, I, amazingly, I find that I agree with you uh, about the current situation, which is, I think, interest rates should be coming down faster than the Bank of England is doing because we are now in recession and growth is very weak. I don't agree with you about your analysis of why we got into inflation. Uh, it may be that the Bank of England could have uh, acted a little bit earlier, but as everybody knows, the inflation really took off when energy prices rose, um, which was because of the war in Ukraine. In fact, they'd started to rise before that as uh, oil markets and gas markets uh, started uh, constricting. So that was the primary cause of inflation. It was an external shock. And nothing the Bank of England could really have done very much about that because oil and gas prices are not responsive to Bank of England interest rates. So the primary cause of inflation was external. And then the Bank of England did start raising interest rates and inflation has come down. And as you quite rightly said, inflation is now uh, on its way down. But there's a much deeper problem, which is about why we've got such a low growing economy and have had for such a long time, which is we don't invest enough. Neither our businesses nor our public sector invests enough. And that's where growth comes from. Growth comes from productivity improvements, growth and invest investment and so on. And we are consistently the lowest investing country as a proportion well, of GDP in all the G7. Look, I agree with you on the productivity problem. It seems to me 
the reason for the productivity problem is that we have had the drug of cheap labour coming in from abroad, and that has discouraged investment because, particularly with this scheme of getting people from abroad for 20% lower than British wages, the incentive for business is to get cheap labour, not to invest and innovate uh, in mechanising and um, using IT and so on, and that this has held back our productivity over the last 20 years. I, th I agree with you about the problem of the labour market, but I don't think it's about immigration. Immigration is needed to fill jobs, and immigrants earn more for the country than they, uh, than they cost. That is the consistent finding uh, of, uh, of economists. Um, because, uh, as well, Catherine that's, has that's said, a very dodgy statistic <laughs> you've just used, because it doesn't, it doesn't use all the costs of immigrants. So it, it's... it's... <laughs> Let me, let me finish. Um, that's what the economic evidence says. And as it's not. Says, you is, know that. You know better than that. No, that, that no, I can't let you just no, make it, that bold statement because you, you know perfectly well that it doesn't include the on cost, doesn't include the extra school place, the extra hospital no, it, it, needed and so on. So, what you, have to what you have to remember is that immigrants work, the vast, vast majority of them, and or they contribute through their huge student fees, um, and then they buy things. So they contribute to the economy. But then the crucial point is about the kind of labour market we have. We have a very, very flexible labour market. And that means that job wages are too low. And this is the problem. We need higher wages. And you get that by getting uh, better bargaining in the, in the labour market. And what you really need to see is public investment in infrastructure, in the National Health Service, which will get some of those nine people back to work. It's the expenditure in the economy that does the work here. And that's what we really need, uh, we really need in our economy. And, and well, I, I just I, but I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think the flexible labour market is very important to getting any element of growth. But but the, the problem we have is that mass migration has undercut the lowest entrance into the wage market, and therefore but, um, that hasn't pushed up the prices of labour for people we have a in social wage. care and things like that. We have a minimum wage, so it's not undercut. Those, all those jobs at the lowest end are paid at a minimum wage, and that they're, they're not undercut by immigrants. This is just not true. We well, really they clearly are, because the government has a scheme, where you, the shortage scheme, where you can come in and be paid 20% less. So that's 20% less than the market rate. So, so it clearly undercuts it you, according to you, a government are you, scheme. Are you genuinely proposing that we would get more growth with, with much higher vacancies in our economy? What, what immigrants I'm, are doing I'm, are filling vacancies? I'm saying if you had less immigrant labour, you would put up prices and that would get more people into the labour market because it would be much more worthwhile they're working than being on benefits. It would be market forces. But, Unfortunately, Michael, I've allowed myself the final word for which I apologise because we've got to move on, but I hope you'll come back again to continue this discussion. Uh, coming up next, universities are attempting to hold banks hostage to pursue the net zero agenda and the State of the Nation Book Club returns with the illustrious Sunday Times columnist Matthew Side on his book Rebel Ideas. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Lee Anderson's Real World. Fridays from 7 p.m. Dr. Jane Jones, it was the clinical lead for Care After Combat. Yep. Jane, thanks for coming. And uh, just tell me a little bit about your organisation. What do you do? OK, well, thank you for having me here so we can talk about Care After Combat. So we are an organisation, a charity, who work into the prison system, working with military veterans who've somehow got involved with the justice system and... So there's, there's quite a high population of, of ex-service men and women in our prisons. Why is that, do you think? So 2014, the government did a review of who was resident in UK prisons and what they found were that military veterans are the highest occupational group. And this obviously raises some concerns. Yeah. So the government wanted to do something about that. And so they supported Care After Combat initially, just as a scoping exercise, really, to see if there was any way we could help these men and women at actually, you know, understand the problems that led to offending behaviour yeah. and go on to lead successful lives. So what sort of offending behaviour are we talking typically for, for people that's in prison that's actually served in our armed forces? Primarily it's uh, violence. Yeah. So that is the highest offence that, that we work with. Okay. But of course the military, as with everybody else, it's the full range of offending behaviour. Okay, so we're in a pub, Jane. 
Dr. Jane. Uh, and I guess for some people, you know, the odd tip of alcohol is good, uh, yeah. a bit of fun uh, of a weekend, relax, let your hair down. But for some people, alcohol is not always their best friend. And I guess that plays a, plays a part in some of your veterans that end up inside. Yeah. Absolutely. So speaking from my own experience, a good two thirds of the people I work with have some kind of mental health problem or mental health yeah. difficulty, struggling to either adapt into yep. civilian life or with some of the traumas they've experienced during service. People might self-medicate with alcohol to manage some of those thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Oh. Well, welcome back. We've been discussing the ostrich-like behaviour of the Bank of England, and you've been sending in uh, your mail mogs. Richard says, the current governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, oozes indecision, dithering uncertainty, and needs to be replaced before the economy stops with him. And John says, I agree with most of what you say, but not on interest rates. As a retiree using savings to supplement income, I think rates are still too low, and we have become far too reliant on cheap credit. My lifelong savings being eroded year after year by rates lower than inflation. What's the incentive to save? And that's a very fair point. Cambridge University, you may have heard of it, um, it's um, somewhere in East Anglia, is renowned for many things, including the regicide Oliver Cromwell and churning out communists, but also great men such as Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin. But now it seems the university itself has become an activist, with news today suggesting the institution is leading a coalition of more than 20 universities, totalling more than £5 billion in investments, to warn banks to hasten the net zero agenda or face divestment. In other words, this is a mighty act of ESG, environmental social governance, the reckless investment policy whereby institutions aim to redefine business from the duty of delivering profits to shareholders to the pursuit of ideological ends, often at the expense of profit. Well, with me now is Rupert Reid, the co-founder of the Climate Majority Project and former professor at the University of East Anglia. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Um, surely the job of investors is to make money for their institutions, not to parade their political opinions. Jacob, it's nice to see you again. Look, we're talking about educational institutions. Educational institutions, by definition, are concerned about the future. They're concerned about the long run. Right, The students who are at Cambridge right now could live into the 22nd century. What's the world going to be by that time? Well, what we hope, of course, is that it will be a world where the climate's been brought under some kind of control and things aren't spiralling into a worse and worse situation. But it will only be like that if there is a massive shift that everybody needs to take part in to ensure that our future, that our kids have that kind of future, that the people who are students now Get to have a future so that's why it makes total sense for universities to have this kind of policy but does it because they have to exist as institutions they need to be able to fund their activities they need to get their investments right to make sure that they maintain their financial viability and their fiduciary duty to their institution uh, to invest wisely not to invest um, on something that is essentially political and you have a political view about what is needed for climate change with which i may well disagree well, you call it political. What we try to do in the Climate Majority Project is bring people together, a wide variety of people, including notably quite a number of conservatives, such as Lord Deven, the former chair of the Climate Change Committee, to say, actually, the vast majority of citizens are now aware, at least to some extent, of the kind of deep trouble that we are in and the much deeper trouble that we are getting into. So it's not actually about politics fundamentally in that sense. What it's about is about bringing people together in favor of a common sense objective. For example, not heating the sky, right? When we don't have insulation on our houses, we're just heating the sky. A third of British roofs have no insulation in them. That's part of what you call the net zero agenda. It's just common sense, Jacob. 
Well, I'm all in favour of keeping my um, energy bills down, and that's people, people can do that for themselves. That is perfectly possible to um, ensure you keep your energy bills down by putting in insulation, and there are schemes to help people with limited resources. But that's not the that's same as an investment. That, that's not the same uh, uh, as um, an investment policy that ought to be dealing with the reality as it is, and that in an investment policy, of course you have long-term objectives, but you also have short-term opportunities. Um, I, I mean, if you'd bought BP in the middle of 2020, when oil was below zero briefly, you'd have made an absolute fortune in a couple of years, and investment policies need to take into it. It's not about a moral crusade, Jacob. It's about having a future. You talk about the prices of uh, the fossil fuel shares. Actually, they've been tracking well below uh, market rates over the last uh, decade. It makes total sense for universities to invest in the future. Students want their future invested in. That's why these kinds of policies that Cambridge and other universities have brought in now are very popular. And but I've actually not... played a small part in those kind of campaigns myself. Okay. And they've but been, one, fi one, final, kind of one final point, because I've, I've got to move on. If these investments sure. are so good, they'll make them anyway without needing this policy. Look, Jacob, the question is, do you want to be confident that you're going to have a future? Or do you want to gamble on only having short-term economic returns that don't well, deliver I... you a, a world in which we can be confident that our children will grow up? I'll allow you the last word. Thank you for joining me again, Rupert. I hope we'll come back on in future. And still with me is my intellectual panel, Nigel Nelson and um, Catherine McBride. Um, Catherine, their fiduciary duty is to make money, isn't it? Exactly. It is. And also, there is $8 trillion, £8.1 trillion, rather, invested in the City of London in assets under management. 82% of those asset managers have some kind of ESG fund going. So that if Cambridge wants to invest in that, though I, it, the returns are generally lower because they haven't, they missed out on the oil and gas increase, but they don't need to put pressure on banks to change. They can just invest in an ESG fund. Also, it's stunningly arrogant, isn't it? Because £5 oh. billion, pounds, that sounds a lot of money, in terms yes. of the £8 yeah. trillion invested, is it's, a drop in the ocean. It's, Frankly, it's... who do these people think they are? Well, that's, that worried me a lot. You thought these universities all have economics degrees, uh, you know, that you can go and study economics there, but obviously their vice chancellors or whoever made this decision don't know anything about economics or about the City of London. Because if you look at the FTSE, it's very heavily geared to, you know, one, they also don't, not just not in investing in fossil fuels, they're not going to invest in related industries, which would include the plastics, chemicals, pharmaceutical, um, organic chemistry. Th these are our biggest exports. I mean, people are complaining that no one's investing in the UK. Well, if banks have this kind of program that they can only invest in green things, well, then they're not going to be investing yeah. in the UK. Nigel, it is really stupid policy, isn't it? Because... No, I'm, I'm with Rupert on this one. All right. <laughs> um, I mean, a university is like any other, other cu customer. They can actually bank with or invest with, with who they like. Oh, hold on, hold That's on. They've got a fiduciary duty. If you, if you want to divest from um, oil companies, that's absolutely fine. You're an individual. If you're a multi-billionaire, that's fine. If it's your company, that's fine. But what they're saying is that they, 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 they don't yes. want to invest in, in uh, banks which are then investing in fossil fuels. They think that will actually put net zero back rather than increasing but it. But that's not... A, the, that's not maintaining their fiduciary duty. No, but, but the whole thing is that they should be allowed to make a decision for themselves. It's not their money. That's the point. It's not their money. Well, they are trustees for the money. That's why, in America, trustees are being sued for getting poor returns by investing in their political opinions rather than the interests of the investment return. That's where they're going wrong. And I, I think if somebody sues them, they'll get in trouble. Well, but, I mean, it still seems to me that they should be able to make the decision. That I remember when I was first getting a bank account, I wouldn't have banked with Barclays because of apartheid. But do you accept... As a result of that pressure, Barclays pulled out of South Africa by 1986. Nigel, I never interrupt you, but I have to this time. <laughs> but we never do. But, but on this occasion, yes, what you do as an individual, you're completely entitled to. You're entitled to shop in the co-op because it backs the Labour Party. Um, that's a fair decision to make. But you don't have a fiduciary duty to look after the money in the best interests of the people on whose behalf you invested as trustee. But that's why I object to what the university is doing. But the point certainly that Rupert was making was that that is not in the best interests of the people that you're investing on, on, on behalf of. But the point I made to Rupert at the end was that if these other investments are so good, they'll make them anyway. They don't need to make this statement. 
but they can they can look around for those other investments. But what? But but why can't they turn around and say, look, we do not want to actually invest in banks that in, that also are um, investing in fossil fuels because their job is to make their best return. So if their it's, best it's worse than that. There's well, another sign to it you're not elsewhere. looking at. Cambridge, 8.1% of their student body come from China. Who's the biggest emitter of carbon fossil fuels in the world? 31%. China. Uh, China's given them £30 billion um, pounds in donations. £30 billion? Pounds. No, million, sorry. Million, sorry. Million pounds in donations. Million. Are they giving that money back to China? Are they refusing to take Chinese students until China stops admitting carbon uh, CO2? Well, we don't know what the not. Chinese students think. It may well be that they're very keen on net zero well, too. Either way, you can't sort of be forcing Barclays to stop investing in fossil fuels when this is where our electricity is coming from right now. That orange stuff is gas, OK? 36% gas. This bit is wind, only 24% wind. If we stop investing in gas... We're going to have blackouts. We're going to run out of... We're going to be like South Africa. They the have whole, blackouts all the time. But, but if we follow, follow your model, we'll never get to net zero anyway. That's why I regret the fact that Labour is not spending that £28 billion on a green industrial revolution. I think they should be both for economic reasons and for environmental ones. Well, if that's actually viable, it will happen anyway. Most things have happened... Not unless we invest in it. No, we, the government is really bad at investing in anything. They can't pick winners. They're, they're not good at it. If they could, they'd be running hedge funds. They wouldn't be in government. You know, it's just ridiculous, the idea that they'd have any idea what they're doing, with the exception of you, Jacob. You're the only one who actually has run a hedge fund. But all the rest of them, forget it. They're not going to know a good investment from a bad one. But the whole point about, about investing in, uh, in green energy is that you will do things like bring bills down, that if you don't well, invest... Well, no, that's not if happening. You don't, if you do, well, our bills are high moment, because of our green it. energy. So, unless you invest in offshore wind... We have onshore more wind. offshore wind than any other country. That's but, a great but we don't have our... enough. So, I mean, what would have no, happened under that £28 the... billion was we don't that offshore wind would have been quadrupled. Wind. Our real problem with wind is it's not constant. No, We're not in a place I'm where you... I'm not saying the wind is ideal. What I'm saying is that, it, that we've got to actually invest in those things for economic reasons. We need to leave the world in green technology because that is the direction of global travel. Um, and if we can get it get in on the act, we're looking at, what, a trillion pounds of, of business that we can actually gain for the UK? Well, that's just made-up numbers. You're just making that up. Well, I'm do, sorry. Do, is, is the 28 have, billion a made what, up number what, that Labour have now scrapped? Which, what, as I say, I, keep, I regret they've done What expertise do we have in this business? I'm sorry, say again. Yes, Cambridge University also, if they don't want to take, put, invest in fossil fuels, are they still going to train engineers and chemical engineers and people who are working in the in refinery industry who are making all of our plastics? We have driven so much industry out of the UK with this stupid green agenda. And you can Brilliant. see it in... <laughs> well, I'm going to give Catherine the final word on this. Thanks to my panel. Coming up, the moment you've all been waiting for, I'll be revealing the poll results of what you think the overground six lines should be called. And don't forget, Sunday Times columnist Matthew Side will be joining me to discuss my complaint that MI5 is institutionally racist to white people. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6 a.m. Marnie says being sexy in business is entirely possible and maybe even better. Well, Marnie, this is something I would say is true. I've had to live with this for quite a long time, <laughs> and uh, I think you can. I think you can do both. Now, tell me, it's lovely to see you first of all. Thank you for having me. In all your gorgeousness. <laughs> Um, and you're telling me that that often is regarded as something derogatory or something to hold you back. Is that right? It's just this really unfair thing, this really unfair narrative that women can't do both. Even men can do both. As you know, Eamon, you can do it, you wow. can do it all. Um, and I just think, you know, women are so multifaceted. They can be mothers, they can be sexy, they can be businesswomen, they can be silly, they can be all these different dimensions. And this, this press push that we have to yes. limit ourselves to one category, yeah. it's just unfair. But do you think... I think that is where some people may be wrong-footed or go wrong to underestimate you. 
Exactly. There is that saying, disarm with charm. So, you know, that there is that, that idea that people do look at someone who cares about how they look, who's perhaps a bit feminine, uh, and underestimate them. But hopefully I've proved that wasn't the case in the boardroom. And thank goodness for Karen Brady. She's definitely up the glam stakes on the show. And if anybody can prove that you can be sexy and successful in business, I suppose it's her, really. But where do you think most of the criticism comes from? Because I have to say, hard to believe, but when I was younger, I certainly got a bit of this at my old employer being told that I had to dress a certain way, not to be too sexy, which I found hugely... I'm you were offensive. told this by women. I was told this by a female boss who didn't like me wearing zips on the back of my dress. Not just me, but some of the other presenters yeah. there. And I took such offence. I felt like she thought that I was some sort of... I don't know what. Um, yeah. do, you, do you take offence when people are criticising you that, you know, in some way they think you're... I don't know. There's just no right answer. And as we said, I think Karen Brady is doing an excellent job at leading the charge that you can be glamorous and get the job done. Mm. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Oh, welcome back. We've been discussing virtue signalling universities, getting their money from China and then complaining about ESG. So we've had Graham say, university threatening banks, talk about the tail wagging the dog. And Susan, why don't the universities take an issue with war, teach their students to talk peace? We may not have a future with World War Three on the way. Think about the pollution with every bomb. And also think about ESG and disinvestment from armaments company, which we now suddenly discover that we need. Virtue signalling can be dangerous. As promised, a roll of drums, the moment you've all been waiting for. News emerged that Sadiq Khan spent nearly £7 million of your money renaming six London overground lines, the Windrush Line, the Weaver Line, the Suffragette Line, the Mildmay Line, the Lioness Line and the Liberty Line. Obviously, the whole thing is a waste of money. The overground lines didn't have names until now, but this made no difference. But we have asked the great British people what they thought of this. And with me now is my panel to discuss this in a moment. Should the lines be named after, A, Britain's greatest victories, such as the Battle of Quebec, Agincourt, Seven Years' War, or our greatest colonial viceroys and governor-generals, such as Lachlan Macquarie or Warren Hastings, or C, my six children, Peter, Mary, Thomas, Anselm, Alfred and Sixtus. And I'm delighted to give you the results. A scored a quarter of a percent. B scored a quarter of a percent. C scored 99.5 percent. And I'm deeply grateful to Kim Jong-un for counting the ballot on my behalf. So now, over to my panel, Nigel Nelson and Catherine McBride. Nigel, the wisdom of the British people. Well, indeed, yes. I mean, a remarkable result there on that poll. Very satisfactory. <laughs> um, I don't know what all the fuss is about the, the, these lines. It seems to me perfectly sensible to uh, to change it, that all we had was a kind of mishmash of orange on the, on the map. Um, um, and it was very difficult to navigate. So the six, the, the six million odd pounds will go on things like new station signs, new maps, new public information systems. Um, and Sadiq Khan's chosen things that are pretty non-political. I think there's nothing controversial about suffragettes, Windrush. The, the, I thought Mild May was a um, restaurant in Glyndebourne. I didn't realise it had any other significance. <laughs> no, it's so no Joe Hospital. <laughs> right, I, I, I've never heard of it in I that I had camp. to look there, why not? But it is, it's yeah. one of the nicer restaurants as well. They're all nice at Glyndebourne, but that's all yes. I knew it for, and I thought it was very odd to take the smartest opera house. Well, it would have been. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it comes from, yes. Yeah. But are they so uncontroversial that they're actually quite boring? Well, I mean, it, the important thing is, what, what, how else do you do it? You could, I suppose, ask the public, ask the travelling public, what they'd like. I have Boaty McBoaty McBoaty is what, brilliant. Well, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, except they didn't do it. They, I know, which was miserable. They named a little sub instead, I made a McBoaty face. But, uh, but that's what you get with the public. But I just think the ones that have been chosen, they have a connection with the bits of London they go through. Um, and this, this claim that suddenly Sadiq Khan is doing something terribly woke, he's actually improving... Uh, 
uh, life for the travelling public. OK, it's a perfectly fair thing to do, reasonable use of taxpayers' money, £6 million we don't really need, so whatever it was, <laughs> so let's spend it on giving some jolly names to a few um, railway lines. Well, I, I would have thought he had better things to do with £6 million, maybe cutting down on the knife crime or preventing crime in general, the theft rate, things like that. However, being a foreigner, I kind of like the ones that say Piccadilly line because I know where they're going. And I wonder, Northern Line, North and South, you know, Bakerloo's a bit confusing for the young players, but we get used to it eventually. So why not say the Croydon line? You know, why the Windrush line? It's going to Croydon and everyone needs to know how to get there. So why Does everyone we... need to know how to get to Croydon? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, yeah. the Windrush line, because it goes through that part of London uh, yeah. where most of the people during Windrush ended up. So yes. it seems to be a relevant kind of title to actually use. Well, that's true. And we do have the Jubilee line, which has a name which doesn't really reflect what well, it Well, we've goes got to. the Victoria line and the Elizabeth line. Shouldn't yeah. we have had the Charles line? Well, I thought Victoria was because it went to Victoria Station. Is it well, but, but the then Queen? Victoria Station is it after Queen Victoria, so yes. it all, yes. it all but there's comes no, out. There's no railway station where Charles is named yet. Well, perhaps there should be. There perhaps you should, should have done that, too. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't object to a Charles station if, if yeah. they decided on that. But then a Weaver station to go through London's textile di district, again, it seems to me perfectly relevant. It, but isn't it unimaginative? Would, I mean, to go back to our earlier point, wouldn't it have been more fun to give voters a chance, do a poll like the one I did. I mean, I'm sure Steve <laughs> Carr could have <laughs> counted it in the same way. And named it after all your children. Well, that would be a interesting way to see how that would go down. Uh, I'm not sure it would do his election chances any good but it, um, later, on, later on this year. But, but it is... the, the suffragette line, I mean, the suffragettes are quite notoriously uh, blue-plucked in Chelsea. There's several pankers. So I wasn't quite sure how the suffragette line is at the other end of town. Um, and the, but uh, votes for women isn't contentious, is it? So that's the important thing. Well, it's thing. not contentious, but it's got nothing to do with... Well, I, you know, less to do with the railway line, shall we say. Um, you know, why not name it after famous railway engineers? The yeah, Isambard the Kingdom Brunel line. Yeah. It'd be a bit of a yeah. mouthful, that one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what about the, the Stevenson line or something like that? You know, why, don't, why are you suddenly calling the suffrage... Oh, the line yeah, I, mean, I think line. there are lots of different I mean, choices, but the ones he made seem to me perfectly reasonable ones. Well, that's true. They it's really worse. the money. I don't particularly yeah. mind the naming, and I, don't, I agree with you. But I think the cost, names yeah. are unobjectionable. But you've got 6,000 stations... But where you, you need really to... need to spend that money. Well, you do. Weren't they quite happy without names? If you think about 6,000 stations which need new signage, that's going to be really expensive. Yes. Yes, but can't you implement it as you need the signs, that you don't need to have this big, expensive step, do you? Well, I mean, either way, you'd end up spending that kind of money over a period but of time. But additional money, whereas now you spend £6 million up front. I just wonder yeah, whether yeah. it's necessary and whether well, you need to spend this money when we're short of public money. Well, I mean, you can say that about anything, can I know, you? I often do. <laughs> that's the problem. Excellent. Well, that seems a good point to draw this discussion yeah. to the to a close. And I thank you for voting in the way you did to my uh, loyal viewers. Um, Sadiq Khan said, giving each of the overground lines distinct colours and identities will make it simpler and easier for passengers to get around. Mr Khan said on Thursday, in reimagining London's tube map, we are also honouring and celebrating different parts of London's unique local history and culture. Underground, overground, wombling free, the wombles of Wimbledon would be pleased, I imagine. Anyway, thank you to my panel. Coming up, I'll be getting to the bottom of whether MI5 is institutionally racist to white people or not. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Patrick Christie's Tonight. Weekdays from 9 p.m. Mike Freer joins me now. Mike, thank you very much for coming no, into the studio. Thank you for inviting me. Um, firstly, how are you? It's been a busy day and uh, it's been a quite a traumatic experience. It's a, it's a real wrench to walk away from a job that you love, but also a constituency 
that um, you become, you know, I live there, it's my home, and I regard many of my constituents as friends, and um, it is an amazing, amazing place. And so a walk away from that um, is really quite, uh, it's quite an emotional um, wrench to think this was a job I loved, and, but unfortunately I can't do it anymore. Can you talk me through the process? Because you mentioned about the you know, alleged arson attack, etc., being the final straw, mm. but this has been a really quite a vile journey to get to this point. So what kind of threats have you had? What's that look like? Well, like every MP, I mean, you, you, day in, day out, you get abusive emails, you get low-level stuff that, whether we should accept it, but we do, it's graffiti, you know, it's um, things like, you know, I've had, in the past I've had a mock Molotov cocktail left on the office door, meaning we had to evacuate the whole building. I've come out, and, out of my house and found, a, a, you know, a note on my car. Um, where I live is common knowledge, but what I drive is less so. And it's a few weeks after uh, John Mann had had the wheel nuts on his car tampered with. So that all kind of makes you get a bit, you know, what on earth's going on. But I, I've had two run-ins with the organisation that was Muslims Against Crusades and people like Anjum Chowdhury, um, who was behind that organisation, um, been to prison. But Online, it said, I, I used to do surgery mo in mosques, uh, surgery mosques, so I wanted to go yeah. out and see people. And online, there's a picture of me saying, you're not welcome in our, uh, our mosque, let Stephen Timms be a pointed reminder. So it's not very subtle. Well, just for our viewers and listeners who might not remember that. Stephen that Timms, mean? of course, was stabbed um, by a woman who'd been radicalised. Um, thank heavens he survived. So it was a very unsubtle. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomney Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Just a few months ago, State of the Nation revealed its scoop after we discovered that MI5 had been offering internships exclusively to non-white people. I accused the Domestic Intelligence Agency of being institutionally racist to white people. Here's a reminder. MI5 is institutionally, publicly racist. It discriminates against 92.6% of my constituents in North East Somerset. If you're poor, if you've been failed by the education system, if, as with James Bond, you're an orphan, don't apply to MI5. It won't have you as an intern if you're white. Well, a certain distinguished Sunday Times columnist, Matthew Side, responded on Twitter and said, Please read Chapter 1 of Rebel Ideas to see why it's critical for intelligence agencies to recruit on ethnicity. It will take 50 minutes, and if you don't change your mind, I'll refund your money or come on your show to debate. Well, it's been a few months, and I've read the book, and Stay the Motion Book Club starts now. With me now is the man himself, Sunday Times columnist and author of Big Ideas, Matthew Side. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, for anyone who hasn't read your book already, they really should. Rebel Ideas, it's extremely interesting. Um, and as one would expect of a Sunday Times columnist, uh, well written. And I didn't find I disagreed with you particularly. I was just rather surprised you didn't... Um, you tweeted as you did, because... I'm not against MI5 recruiting from a broad base. I think that's very important but I'm against it saying that my constituents are excluded because they may have knowledge that MI5 needs. So, first of all, thank you for having me on and thanks for reading the book. Delighted you enjoyed it. Rebel ideas rather than big ideas. Rebel ideas, um, sorry. It seems to me, Jacob, that in, in a domain like intelligence, where you're seeking to understand and anticipate threats either emerging from outside the country or within, if you have a group of people who come from very similar backgrounds, uh, who share the same kind of tacit knowledge, then they're likely to potentially miss things. And the point that I think I was making in the book, particularly in Chapter 1, is that this was a fundamental error of the CIA in the post-war period, where a very high proportion came from a very narrow background that matched, Jacob, the background of the recruiters, because recruiters were attracted to people who looked and sounded like them. It's quite an ancient bias that was uh, once referenced by Aristotle, Homophily, and so very high... I think you're going to read but, the but, stats. Well, I'm going, I'm going actually to jump to the very end of the book, partly to prove that I read right to the end. <laughs> 
uh, which is very rare for book reviewers, I think. And you quote Fanusi, who goes to work for the CIA, and he says you should never hire people just because of their cultural or ethnic background. That would be a dangerous mistake. But when you widen the net of recruitment, you also broaden the pool of talent. So I'm all in favour of widening the pool of recruitment. It's just the bit I object to is when you say, and therefore we won't have any white people. That, I think, is going too far. I, I, I very much doubt that that is what MI5 or MI6 it's was saying. It's what it's done for the internship. It specifically well, said you, white people couldn't apply. But perhaps I'll ask you a question. If, if we agree about the principle that you are trying to anticipate threats from tribal societies, ones with different patterns of religious radicalisation and societal breakdown, you want to make sure... The problem, Jacob, if we all, I hope you'll agree, share have blind spots of one kind or another. And if we share the same blind spots, the organisation has a blind spot. What you're seeking to do is make sure that you plug those by bringing people from different backgrounds. And if MI5, MI6, GCHQ felt that they had a very disproportionate group of people from a particular cultural background, then it would make sense to be proactive. In the same way, for example, that a scientific team that lacked mathematical expertise would be very sensible to specifically look for someone with a background in mathematics. We may be being a bit like the medieval <coughs> theologians and arguing about the number of angels on a pinhead, because I'm not particularly disagreeing that it's perfectly legitimate to try and recruit from a broad base. And to go and say, if you want to understand um, the Afghan tribes, right. to go and find people who understand Afghan tribes, yeah. who are much more likely to be people with some Afghan heritage than they are going to be my constituents. But if one of my constituents happens to have spent right. years learning about it, yeah. you shouldn't say the internship excludes white people. Yeah, that's, that's, what, right. that's the bit I object to. And I, I, uh, I think we're coming to agree. I do agree. And, and one of the things I say in the book is I am very doubtful about quotas. I think that that can have the effects that are opposite to the one intended. And although the evidence is rather mixed on this, I, d I do think we agree. And it, but it's about more than intelligence. It's about more than government. The most successful private sector institutions, DeepMind, Microsoft, this is an almost $3 trillion company. They know that if they're going to anticipate the future disruptions, if they're going to shape the modern technological world, they need to have people with different backgrounds. Sometimes it's different... Uh, demographic backgrounds, but often it's different expertises that they need in order well, to understand the well, future. I, I thought we make this point beautifully on page 67, which I mentioned so it can be put up on the, on the screen, um, when you talk about four economists, the first two, one, white, gay, male and middle-aged, the other, young, black, female, heterosexual. These economists are in different demographic terms, but they were both taught by the same professor against two white middle-aged bespectacled economists who have the same number of children and like the same TV programmes. They may sound the same, but one's a Keynesian and the other's um, a monetarist. And you get two economists who will be very different demographically but identical in their thought and two identical demographically but with thoughts completely opposite. But, and right. actually it's the second that you want Indeed. and it's how you get there. And quotas militate against that. They can do. And I remember going and giving a talk to a... Um a professional services firm and their senior leadership team. And on the surface, they looked to be diverse in terms of demography, colour, ethnicity. But they'd all been there for so long that they had started to think in the same way. They were using the same words, the same examples, the same historical precedents. And I realised that they were going to have a real problem in anticipating what was going to happen because it was a part of the corporate world that was about to experience huge disruption. And they were very blinkered. And the other thing you mentioned that's fascinating, which we don't have a lot of time to go into, is that if you have a leader who has a strong view in a meeting, all the meeting does what he, and it very often is he, says, and you need to encourage people to speak out. And I love some of the examples about that you gave. Thank you. Uh, that, I think, is very significant, because often people who get to the top, they have very strong convictions, nothing wrong with that. But if they find it difficult when people disagree with them, um, and they're quite domineering. We're quite hierarchical animals. People tend to say not what they truly think, but what they think the leader wishes to hear. And that narrows the bandwidth of the group to just one leader. The one variable that is so important in high-performing teams is where we argue, come to a timely decision, but where we also are prepared to test each other's ideas and we don't get offended when somebody criticises mine.
People must look up, because we don't have time, the Andaman Islands in the index, because your example from there is fascinating. So do buy the book. Uh, that's all from me. Up next, it's Patrick Christie's. Patrick, what have you got on the bill of fare this evening? OK, so astonishing new revelations about this judge who was involved in the pro-Palestine paraglider protest centre. See, also, as well, I've got an exclusive on the Rochdale grooming gang, so make sure that you stay tuned for that. And, of course, we are going live as the polls slam shut at Kingswood and Wellingborough. We are Britain's election channel and we're going to be doing a right number on these two by-elections for you at 10pm. Well, that's going to be extremely interesting. I meant to say I'm going to be back at 8 o'clock on Monday. I'm actually going to be back at 1.30 this morning uh, from one of the by-election sites. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg. This has been State of the Nation. And you probably have a fair idea what the weather's going to be like in Somerset. It will be fantabulous. I cannot think of a better place to spend the weekend. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update with me, Annie, from the Met Office. Friday's going to be a much drier and brighter day for many of us, but we have still got some heavy rain to come through the rest of the evening. That's as a result of this weather front that's slowly pushing eastwards across the country through the rest of the day and through tonight. So there's still some heavy rain to come across parts of the southwest. That'll push into the Midlands later on this evening and then into the southeast, but rain should be fairly limited by the time it arrives into the southeast. Behind it, it should turn much clearer as well. So some clear spells to come tonight, but still got very mild air. So it will be another very mild night tonight, frost free across the country by tomorrow morning. There'll also be some early sunshine, particularly across eastern areas of Scotland, as well as central areas of England too tomorrow morning. And we'll see a good deal of sunshine through the day. Some thicker cloud across parts of northwestern England, North Wales, that could be thick enough to bring some drizzly rain. But in any of the sunshine, it'll feel fairly pleasant highs of 13 or 14 degrees in the south or 12 degrees further north. A bright start to Saturday across eastern areas but cloud will thicken through the day as this weather front approaches. So some drizzly rain in the west through the morning and then a heavy spell of rain to come through the evening across western areas and perhaps on Sunday morning in the east. But 